So my name is Travis Spencer. I am the founder and CEO of both Tuba Technologies and Nordic APIs. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about a brand new programming language that I'm very excited about. It's called Kotlin, uh, which I was told during the break is actually named after a Finnish island. So very appropriate that we are at least in the region uh, of Kotlin, speaking about Kotlin. And uh, I have to give a couple of disqualifiers. I'm a identity management expert, so I can't remember the last time I gave a talk where I wasn't talking about digital identity. Uh, so hopefully, if you answer your question, if you ask a question about Kotlin, I'll know the answer, but I may not. Uh, I really uh, challenged myself uh, over the summer vacation to learn this language and uh, signed up for this talk so that I could learn it enough to not sound like an idiot, uh, but uh, I'm not def definitely not uh, as expert as uh, Renato is on on uh, Groovy. So um, if I start spreading heresy, uh, you guys owe it to your colleagues in the group to call me out on it. But uh, with that disqualifier aside, I want to tell you some uh, really exciting things about it, uh, starting with why you might use it. This was the sort of sales pitch that got me, and this wasn't uh, the, my sales pitch. Uh, I'll go through some of the, the uh, basic syntax. And then what I want to do is talk about how we can use Kotlin with an existing code base. So anybody here in December at the, the meetup group? Um, there, there was, yep. Uh, a few of us, I introduced a, a framework called Spark for building web APIs. It's a, a micro framework. And I'll show you how I ported all of that code uh, from Java to Kotlin and what it looks like. So. Just before going out on summer vacation, I ran into this article on Medium where uh, this uh, author was explaining why we should be using Kotlin and why it was the programming language that he was going to be writing in every day for the next decade. And it, it was enough for me that it was like, okay, I'm going to use my summer vacation to learn that. I love Swedish vacations because this is my, my two weeks to learn something new and to dig into some new technology. And so uh, when my kids were swimming in the pool and uh, after they were in bed and all those things, I was, I was sitting there learning this new language. And uh, the things that sold me is the fact that it compiles down to Java bytecode uh, and it also uh, can compile down to JavaScript. So you can actually write the same code that runs in like Node as in uh, running on the, the Java virtual machine. Um, it's also from industry, not academia. So it's being uh, uh, created by JetBrains. They have tens and tens of thousands of, of files just for IntelliJ with hundreds of thousands of code. They know the pains of Java, but they also know the great benefits of the JVM. So they don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and they're trying to make their own lives better uh, as well as making our own better. And they know where we're struggling because they're struggling there too. It's open source, so it cost me nothing to start using uh, Kotlin. I was fortunate enough to have IntelliJ, which made it a little bit easier, but uh, there is uh, Eclipse plugins, there's all sorts of tooling uh, for Maven and Gradle and Ant and all these different things, uh, which are free and out there, and you can patch them if they don't work. Uh, so there's, there's zero cost in adopting it. There's also a really, really low learning curve. Um, vacation time was more than enough, uh, at least to get started. And it's really convenient for existing Java shops like Tubo uh, or other JavaScript uh, shops because you can use existing frameworks uh, and you can combine the two together. Uh, in a similar way uh, with Groovy like Renato was talking about, you can uh, have Kotlin code together with Java in the exact same code base. You don't have to rewrite everything like if you were adopting Go or something like that. So that was enough to sell me. Uh, if it's not enough to sell you, keep keep listing. Hopefully by the end you'll see the the, the merits of it. Uh, a couple more things before I move on, though. It doesn't require you to write object-oriented code. You can also write functional. Uh, we get the great support in um, uh, IntelliJ and um, uh, Eclipse. I was talking to one fellow during the break uh, saying it's maybe not as great for Android uh, or it wasn't, but it's it, uh, definitely improving. I did not do any Android development with it, so um, perhaps it's not as good for that use case yet. Um, but uh, for server development, for API development, I found it to be totally excellent. Um, and then the strong commercial support from JetBrains makes me think that you know it's going to be around a while, and, and this is something we can bank on. Basic syntax. Um, there's a lot of features. I won't get into them all, uh, and I'm going to go really quick and. Um, so check out uh, the, the Kotlin language website. Um, you can see that here. This is sort of 
where, where you need to go to, to learn all this stuff. Uh, and so if I don't cover some feature uh, or something, you can find it here. Uh, but the ones I'm going to at least cover for now uh, to start with is the function. Um, so we can define a function with just that keyword f f u n. Um, another is the return type. So we return units instead of voids. And uh, if you are returning a unit, it is it is optional. Uh, so you don't have to specify it. Uh, types come after uh, the argument names. So unlike Java, where they they come before. Um, similar to Go, if you're familiar with that language, uh, I find that it reads quite well. It's like args of type. Um, named arguments. I love that. <laughs> I just love that. So now I can write this great code that uses this function and say which argument I'm, I'm calling. And I can have default argument values as well. So for those that I don't actually uh, use, uh, I I can default to those and then name the ones. I can reorder things, whatever makes sense in my client code to make it more readable. So named arguments are great. Single expression functions. So when your, your function here uh, is just a single line or a single expression equals this, then uh, you don't actually need a function body. Saves you a couple lines, removes some noise. Uh, quite helpful. I haven't seen that feature in other languages. Are, do other languages have that that you guys know of? Really what I found was Kotlin was kind of like the best of everything. Best of C-sharp, best of Groovy, best of Python, all sort of munged together, best of Java. Um, passing function literals. So a function that takes a function. Um, what you can do is instead of having to include the function literal as an argument here, like comma and then the expression, what you can do is just close off the call and then have your function literal afterward. Why is that cool? Anyone in write jQuery code? I hate that syntax. It's like all of this sort of nested and nested and nested, and I get lost in like where do I end? And I just feel like I'm in this recursive curly brace hell. You don't have that problem uh, with Kotlin. It's just like, okay, then I have the literal, and even in the literal, it just looks like another function call. So I find that to be a super cool feature. Here's another one, uh, declaration site variants. Um, this is sort of a heady or smart sounding word to just say that you can have a template argument where you will only pass a, um, an object of this particular type out of uh, the class. So then what, you can, what the compiler can do is know that, okay, you, it will only be upcasted because it's only being returned from functions. So even if it's not an actual controllable, if it inherits from controllable, it's safe to be upcasted to controllable at runtime. Uh, so we can allow the, the uh, type to vary at the, uh, the declaration site where that template is instantiated. Make sense? Nullability must be explicit. So like in Groovy, um, you have to say if the type is going to be null, and you have to check for null before you access it. So this saves you from the, the null pointer exceptions showing up. I'll show you some really cool things they also do with the null checks to make it easy uh, in a second. But first, I want to explain this data class. Um, Renato showed us something similar to Groovy with a annotation. What was it called? Was it no? It was canonical. Yeah, canonical. This is basically that, where you get equals, you get hash code, you get two string, and you get copy abilities, like a copying one type of, of this router data to another. Uh, and for any... Um, any read-only variable, it will automatically generate getters and setters. So in Kotlin, you can declare variables as val or as var. So var, they're going to vary. Uh, value, uh, val, it's just going to be a value, and it's going to be uh, immutable. So for any of those uh, immutable types, it will automatically generate getters and setters. So we, we have properties in, uh, in Kotlin uh, as well, which is super great. We all love those in C Sharp, right, right Renato? Um, here's another of my favorite Pythonic idioms where you return multiple things from a function. Uh, we also have this in, in Go. Um, in Go, I think it's more sort of first class. This isn't quite as first class of a, of a capability in, in Kotlin, but it works like in Python where uh, if we have that, that data class, 
And if you saw there, all of the, the getters were path controller class template. Uh, path controller class template immediately get assigned to that. So in one shot, uh, you have three values then that sort of pull that, that uh, class apart into different variables that you can start to do different things with, hopefully in, in different occasions. Uh, also similar to C-sharp um, and some other languages, the methods that it can be overridden need to be specially marked as being overridable, uh, or in this case, we use the keyword open. So any function uh, that you need to uh, or want to be overridable, you have to specially mark it as open. Some people might argue, like, how are you going to make a library and uh, later open that code or things like that? Uh, but it's working in C sharp, and so I, I think that this is this is fine. I mean, I haven't seen any issues there, but like I said, my my depth and experience with the language isn't as deep as as uh, as with Java or um, some of these other languages. So try it out and see. I think it, it works. When you actually want to override it, you have to add this keyword override to say that um, you know, uh, we're overriding the get method that's defined in the uh, interface or in the base class. Named arguments again, love that. Uh, here's another cool one from the Kotlin standard library, uh, map of. So we could just create a simple map, a uh, little function helper. Two, uh, I think this is probably an operator. Uh, I said keyword here, but I, I think I would, I would guess operator. But I looked, I couldn't find out exactly. Uh, but just some syntactic sugar to create an associative array. And here's a cool one, probably one of my favorite features of Kotlin SmartCasts, where here what I'm doing is I'm using Java Reflection uh, to do method.invoke. And this returns back an any, um, any sort of object. And with the explanation point, it, it means like from the platform. Like this could be, um, it could be null, it could not be null. And so result comes back as something, anything. And what we do is we use the is operator to see if it is a, a uh, controller result. And if it's a controller result, what we can do is if this is the case, and, uh, logical and, as soon as we do that, it now is, this result object is a controller result. So we can immediately access the controller results properties. Pretty cool, huh? No cast, no nothing. Let's, let's look at the C-sharp uh, and the Java version of that, because I think I have some time. I wrote all this in a blog post. You can find it on the Nordic APIs website. Um, so if you would prefer to read it rather than have it explained, it's all here. Uh, let's search for C sharp. No. Smartcast. Oh, no, here it is. Ooh, oh. Sorry, ad hocing here. All right, SmartCast. So here's the here's the Java example of this, right? Where here we need to check instance of, and then we need to create another object, cast it. Now it can use its properties, and we don't even get properties. We have getters and setters, so a lot more verbose. Uh, a little bit better in C sharp. I like C sharp actually. I don't like .NET. Um, Controller result, result equals controller result, or as controller result. Now, uh, if this thing is not null, like it would be null if it was cast, controller result dot continue processing. So a little, little better than Java, but certainly not as good as Kotlin, in my opinion. Yeah. No, you have to cast it like as or something like that. If you do if not equals null, then you can do it. So that that was kind of maybe I'm not understanding exactly, but here uh, no, that's not it. Yeah. 
It, it's in the blog. There was an example of that. I'll probably get another 404 if I keep looking for it. <laughs> but yeah, you can do that. Ranges, so another Pythonic feature that I love uh, in Kotlin. So um, if x is in the range of 1 to 10, print this. Uh, in a loop, uh, from uh, as long as a is in 1 to 5, so now we get 1, to 3, 4, 5. Just makes for writing really simple, intuitive code. String interpolation, like uh, Renato talked about in Groovy. So um, uh, dollar and then the curly brace. This is an expression. Uh, if it's a, easy. If it's adding things, uh, it will compute that expression. And you'll see that in an upcoming example. Multi-line string, I added that just because it was New Year's. <laughs> I got that too. So uh, uh, you can just have your, your, your triple strings, uh, like in Groovy and Python, and uh, everything in that, uh, including line breaks and tabs and all that stuff, uh, is in the string. Elvis operator, we got that too. Um, <laughs> I could have just kept adding, but I was like, it, it's in there. Like I said, check kotlinlang.org, and uh, you can see the other features that I'm skipping. Operator overloading. I was too lazy to add a slide. It's supported. Elvis operator, I guess, is because like Elvis left the building. So if Elvis left the building, negative one. <laughs> I don't know if that's right, but I think that's right. Uh, extension functions. Dude, my favorite C-sharp feature. Um, type dot new function. There it is. I don't have to mess with your code. I don't have to inherit from anything. I just I can extend it. Super, super helpful. And I can just create a string. It's just like, then foo, and foo foo. <laughs> <laughs> our, our our code sometimes is kind of funny. <laughs> Yaka was commenting on a commit the other day. It was like setting some value to Joe Mama. He's like, yeah, straight up. Uh, you got to have fun with it, right? And Kotlin lets us have fun. Um, actually, every single line is fun, in my opinion. Um, equality is done right. I mean, Java, what on earth? Uh, B equals a string, some new object. Or A equals some new object. B equals some new object. You set the two equal together. Now, I just want to see, like, are these two equal, like, structurally? Yeah, A and B are the exact same thing. They're empty strings. Are they the exact same object? No. JavaScripters, I mean, this is it. This is what you guys uh, do all the time. I mean, that's what you should do. Is A structurally equivalent to C? Yep, sure are. Are they the exact same object? Yes, those two guys are. I just assigned A to B, or A to C. Basic. Uh, as I mentioned, great tooling. Uh, one of the great tools, well, good tools, uh, is the conversion tool. So you can just like right-click on a code base in IntelliJ or uh, uh, in Eclipse, or even for small snippets on the website, uh, the Kotlin uh, Try Me website, uh, which I'll show you because I think I have time. Let's go here. Try kotlinlang.org. Convert from Java. Paste. I mean, it's, it's for fooling around. But, I mean, over here, all I did is I just right-clicked on this. It's like convert. And it just converted the whole thing. I don't know why you're laughing. It worked, mostly. I think I actually rewrote all that code. That's why I say it's good, not great. Um, Maven, Ant, Gradle. Um, cool one. Java Docs and Markdown. <laughs> um, and other things. A debugger. Who's tried to use Go? Anybody ever tried to use Go? Where GDB, man. <laughs> Crazy. I, I can fix code here. I can support customers with this. I, I've got everything I need to debug remote, local, and it's all in Kotlin. That's nice. That, that's a killer feature for me. OK, so using Kotlin with Spark. Any questions on Kotlin basic syntax? Any heresies? Does that sound all right so far? Cool. 
Spark. So in December, I talked about this cool micro framework called Spark, written by um, a fellow actually in Malmer, and uh, we use it at Tubo all the time. Uh, we wrote it uh, about it a bunch on the Nordic APIs recently. I, I, I like Pear. He's a cool guy. I'm not trying to like. I don't have any stake in that. I just it's really useful framework. I think everybody should use it. And one of the reasons I think everybody should use it is it's so small. It just it doesn't get in your way. It's like it does routing. That's all. It sets up a route. Calls a function. That's it. Really, really easy. Does what it does. Does it really, really well. No XML configuration. No annotations. Um, kind of like um, what's that one? Spring Boot, except that I'm making the decisions about DI frameworks. I'm making the decisions about how controllers are put together. M maybe I'm I'm foolish in doing that because the Spring guys are way better at it, and I should be using Spring Boot, but. For better or worse, it gives you the opportunities to, to put things together the way you want to. And sometimes you need that flexibility. Uh, with just a, a couple lines of code, it starts a web server. Check it out, uh, sparkjava.com. Here's a hello world. This is Java code, not Kotlin, hopefully. You can see that. Um, but the basic syntax using uh, Java 8, where main method, here we got the statically imported get. We've got a route that we're calling hello. Going to call this lambda, return the string, hit that method in your browser, we get hello world. Uh, for those of you who weren't in December, here in December, uh, another little bit more, I won't go f too deep into this, another route called hello. It's a post now, not a get. We've got the post body, very, very easy syntax. Uh, we can also do things like response.redirect, uh, things like this, lots of different capabilities on the request and the response. Other uh, examples, setting status codes, uh, halting, uh, halt should really be called abort, abort the transaction, uh, the request, with a 403, return the string. Going a little fast here, any questions, just raise your hand. Parameterized URL patterns, um, normal, everyday thing you do in APIs. Uh, this is uh, frameworks based on Sinatra, I guess, from uh, the Ruby world. So uh, the syntax has sort of been thought of before. Um, but you got this colon name, and you hit user's name, colon name, when you get it on request parameters, you got it. Helpful just for routing. One of the other things it does give, like one of the only bells and whistles it gives besides starting a web server is templating. So it integrates with a bunch of templating engines. Um, I, I can't remember all of them, but Velocity is definitely one of them. And here we set up a route, hello, some model information, return the model, specify the view, and the engine to, to process that. Cool thing about this, uh, you can use different engines for different routes. Not sure if you'd do that, but you could. Questions on that? How am I doing on time? I feel like I'm cruising. So let's look at some code. So Kotlin, after I ran the converter, I wanted to create a very fluidic, domain-specific language uh, in Kotlin. And one of the appeals for Spark uh, to me at the beginning was that it had that great Java 8 syntax. But th one of the things that uh, Spark lacks that you need is some sort of controller idea, like putting all of your methods in a, cr in a controller and putting all that logic in one place. The other thing that uh, it needs uh, is dependency injection. So we need to write robust testable code. Uh, we need to have those dependencies injected so we can swap them out uh, during tests. And so what uh, I talked about in December was creating some other syntax or some sort of other DSL on top of Spark that will allow us to not only set up the paths, but also say that this particular route should go to this con particular controller. And in some cases, that should be rendered by a template. And the dependencies of this API uh, should be composed by this particular composer. And that should set up the DI uh, containers and things like that. So using a, a bunch of things in Kotlin, which I'll show you, like uh, functions, uh, named arguments, things like that, we can create, a, in, in my opinion, a better domain-specific language for creating routes in Kotlin and that also add this capability of dependency injection uh, and controllers to Spark.
So this is our main method. Uh, if we run this, is it this easy? This will set up routes, login, authentication, token, route it to these different controllers. So now the Spark server is running. Uh, it's got these uh, routes um, lined up on this port. Should I be so bold as to try to hit that? Cool, works. So I hit author. Oh man, it's all off the screen. Sorry about that. Um, I just hit on authorize. I, I needed to try to simulate some sort of logic in these controllers, so I'm simulating the, the OAuth code flow, uh, if you're familiar with it. I hit authorize, I'm not logged in, so I'm redirected to login. I enter some sort of username and password here, and my controller will validate that, and now it will return me to the authorize screen. Uh, here you would normally see some sort of consent screen uh, in OAuth, but I'm not doing any of that stuff. And then you would have your, your code and you'd submit it to your token endpoint and you get a token. So all of that sort of logic, you wanted some sort of controller or many controllers. And that is what I'm doing here in these routes where you know the login controller uh, is handling the, the logic around that authorization controller, its own logic. And these guys both have a UI, which you saw. And then the token controller, which doesn't have a UI, uh, doesn't use the render to specify a template. So this application, uh, through some of these different functions like API and route, uh, will create an application. This inherits from Spark application, uh, and uh, this will create a router, and the, the router uh, is really the sort of way that we tie together uh, Spark and dependency injection and the controllers. So this is sort of, by inheriting from Spark application, we get access to Spark's low-level APIs, which are what is being used in these um, static uh, get methods, post methods, those sort of things. So instead of using those, we're using the lower-level API to set up these routes. And before it does that, uh, we're using this router, which is going to give us the chance to do the, the stuff with the I and, and uh, whatnot. Questions? Okay, so the application, we have a composable. Um, we have the possibility to compose at the application level and also at the request level for anything that uh, in implements this interface. In this project, I have two, but this is the only one that I'll show. Um, container composer, where the composer uh, application will uh, add two components, uh, the uh, login controller, token controller, and authorization controller. Um, what, what we're trying to do here with, with doing this is that you know a controller should be quick and easy to build. You shouldn't have to know about routing. Um, and all of its dependencies should be injected. So when that thing comes to life, it has everything it needs to, to do to operate. And in order for that to happen, it needs to be put into the, the container. And you could have different uh, scope of, of those objects when they're newed up. Uh, as the app starts, or they're newed up uh, with every single uh, request. So we have the, the container composer, and then I showed you uh, the router, and the method I want to show you is route to. So after we create the router, uh, we're going to, we don't want every controller to have to, f to specify and say what it should, what it wants to route. It's just a, con uh, a controller is going to have gets and posts, and those methods are going to automatically be, be called. And rather than decorating them with annotations like some other frameworks have, we're just going to use a convention that says if there's a get, if there's a post, if there's a delete on the controller uh, that uh, is overriding methods in the, the controller class, then we're going to route those. So what we do here is we just go through uh, each of the methods uh, in that uh, declared class in the controller class we're going to not do anything with get and before because it's sort of pre-processing, post-processing. Then we're going to loop through all of the interfaces in the controllable class. And then we're going to make sure that the, the, the names match, the return types match, they have the exact same parameters. And then what we're going to do is we're going to either set it up with a template, uh, if we were given a template, 
or we're going to uh, or set it up if it wasn't called with a template or set it up if it was called with a template. And here is an example to answer your question uh, about the nulls where uh, the smart cast is done here because we say uh, template equal equal null and then uh, because it, it uh, is not null, it's smart casted. So we don't have to do anything there. We can call is blank. So these methods are basically, well, they're very similar. The important part is that we create a closure here uh, R with an inline function, and then we pass that function down into here. This is the th sort of that. And what's cool about that is that every single time the API is requested, that closure will be called, and consequently the router method will be called the router method on the router class. And so now, in router, what we can do is say, create a new uh, container. In this example, I'm using Pico. The cool thing about Spark, again, is it doesn't stipulate. So you can use in inject in Kotlin, which is a, a native uh, Kotlin uh, DI framework. You could use, uh, Ju what's that Google one called? Juice, is it? Is it? No, that's the collection framework. Anyway, you can use any sort of DI framework. Um, but in this example, I'm using Pico. Um, create some sort of empty model, uh, call the request, uh, the, the um, get component to get me the controller. So now I've got it. it. All of its dependencies are also resolved. Call before on that, and then figure out which method I'm calling, get, post, put, whatever. And then actually call that method here, which is the one I showed you before we were doing the smart casting and all that sort of stuff. Questions? I kind of brushed over this, but uh, this is what you might expect. Uh, we have uh, this abstract class, uh, controllable, where you have before and after and all those things, but we also have get, post, put, all those different HTTP methods uh, that, the, that by convention then will start to route. Um, interestingly, and I, I don't know exactly why, uh, but this code here that set up the routes, this code, was a direct translation from the the uh, conversion tool. And I would expect that it would produce the same results since it's using Java reflection, but it doesn't. Uh, and so that's why in the Kotlin example, it's an abstract class. So that actually uh, made this get methods return just the, uh, class, uh, the methods that have been overrided in the controller rather than all of the methods, uh, including the ones that weren't overridden from the interface, which you need so that you only set up routes for the ones that you're overriding. Okay, now we have the controllers. So this was the first one that I hit. Um, some before logic like I showed you. Spark has before and afters. Um, but we want to have a, an algorithm around that where we want to continue processing. With Spark, it's like it's gonna call before, it's gonna call uh, the method that's been routed, and it's gonna call after. And we wanna have some logic here to say like, you know, if they're not authenticated, we want to abort the uh, the transaction uh, or the request, and and do not you know bother calling get or something because they're not authenticated. Uh, so we have this this before logic here. Again, you're seeing things like override. Uh, you're also seeing us mix in a bunch of JDK frameworks. Works great. And then the other one, login controller. Again, using you know servlet API and stuff directly here in Kotlin. So really what I hope you get from this, even though it was really fast, is that we get a super shiggery syntax um, in Kotlin. In Spark, we get a framework that does something, one thing really, really well uh, with a couple bells and whistles, where you can add in uh, other things like uh, controllers, DI, everything you need to build a very robust basis on which to construct your APIs. Um, and then uh, um, th that's running on the JVM, you know, this, this platform that's really ubiquitous and you can do all sorts of uh, amazing things with and sort of this triad uh, or trifecta of like the best of the best. So I, I, at, at Tubo we've said that anything that you're, you're free to write Kotlin code uh, for anything that's not shipping. And then as soon as V1 ships, you can write it in, in product code even. So 
the the syntax is is so great that I mean we all want to use it, and um, so that's the approach that we're we're taking. And I, th I hope that you'll have a look at it, uh, look at the language. I think it has a lot of great things to offer, even ones that I I didn't have a chance to get into. Uh, fool around with it. Uh, you can easily do that on the website, and and think about you know if you should have a similar roadmap of, of starting to use this this language in your code base. Run the converter, see what some of the syntax looks like. Um, see how easy it is to integrate with Maven uh, or Gradle or what have you. Um, another thing that might help you with your uh, investigation of the language is that you can find the old code from the December meetup in the history of this project on GitHub. So if you look at the history, it's basically the December code and then converted and then all their changes are made with the different uh, uh, commits and, and comments and things like that so you can see sort of my learning process and maybe that will help you with yours. And uh, one thing I think that would be super cool is if, if we took this and we sort of pulled out uh, a bunch of this into a framework and, and built a, a uh, sort of an extension to Spark that supported controllers, supported dependency injection, uh, those sort of things, and, and maybe even commit that back uh, to the, the Spark community. Here's some links if you want to snap a picture of that. Um, intro to Spark on the Nordic APIs website. We got a, a great blog post there. My Kotlin talk that I just gave in two blog posts, and then the source code that I just referred to. That's it. Questions? Like, I, I would guess it's probably using something like um, uh, Java Native Interface or something, but I, I don't honestly know. Other questions that I might know the answer to? All right, well, no, yeah. I, I didn't notice any slowness. Um, I think that uh, it, it is a lot faster than some of the alternatives I read. Um, like that's one of the big complaints about Scala, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it wasn't it wasn't slow in my experience. All right, well, grab me afterward. Thanks for taking the time so late after working all day, and uh, um, really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah.